I'm Alistair Cook, and I'm going to discuss whether hardware actually matters in the cloud, because of course we've all been told that the cloud means we don't have to care. My background is on-premises virtualization. I used to teach VMware courses for a long time. Now I'm teaching cloud provider courses because we're all moving towards the cloud. You can find me. Uh, I'm at Demitas NZ or NZ for my uh, US-based friends, and uh, I'm here in New Zealand, which is the NZ. Uh, you can find me also, my writings at my demitas.co.nz site. One of the things that's driving this idea that hardware is less important is this quote from Mark Andreessen, that software is eating the world. What Mark's really saying here is that companies are changing the way they operate, and companies that are driven by software, um, like Uber and uh, Airbnb as being the, the top examples, are disrupting legacy industries that are much less customer focused and, and deliver a, a much more static service. And so this idea that software is eating the world, absolutely, it is, it is absolutely out there. But we in the tech industry tend to look at it from our own lens and think that that means that hardware is less important because software is all that matters. And there's a second factor that comes in that there's this illusion that the cloud is all just a homogenous sea of servers, that it's all the same servers and they're all interchangeable and replaceable. And these two pieces sit together to give this perception that hardware doesn't matter, particularly in the cloud. Now, it's not cloud providers that sell the story. It's often on-premises providers who want to sell you a sea of exactly the same server. Uh, because they'll show you this picture of these rows of racks of the same servers in a cloud data center. But what they won't do is zoom outwards and show you that this data center has dozens of rows and different rows have different configurations of servers. And this is primarily because these cloud providers have specific servers for particular applications. And so the key thing is that that software that's eating the world needs hardware. The software that is allowing that innovation actually sits on top of hardware underneath and uses that hardware to deliver the capabilities that the applications drive out. We've seen this for a long time. We saw those increasing speeds of CPUs over time. And we saw improvements in what our applications could do as those speeds came up. Now, we may not actually write our software, deploy software with an understanding that it knows about what the underlying hardware is. And this is because usually the application development tools, the actual development environments, the libraries that we use, look after the awareness of the hardware and the advanced capabilities of the hardware. So whereas historically we'd see those clock speed increases, and, and I, you may notice I'm a little short on here and what's here is going gray, that indicates I've been in this industry for some time and, and have seen these cycles of faster CPUs and then software using those capabilities. Well, when was the last time we saw a big advance in CPU speeds? It's been quite some time. But we do see faster applications because there's capabilities that are added to the CPUs beyond just changing the clock speed. There tends to be this move towards accelerators for specific workloads. And again, having been in the industry a long time, I remember the first of these was the multimedia extensions or MMX that were Intel released in the 1990s. This was the first time you could actually play video on a computer and it was pretty revolutionary at the time. These days with uh, YouTube and, and Netflix, it seems pretty mundane. Uh, but, of course, Intel has moved on since then. Uh, we've seen moves towards encryption in hardware, so the AES NI uh, extensions that were added to the Intel CPUs that shifted us away from needing hardware offload to do SSL at scale. We can do encryption, we can do uh, compression in hardware, and we're seeing this continue with the SGX extensions that have been added to the Intel CPUs in the last year and a half to further improve the security stance. All of these features that are being used by software require that close interaction between the hardware provider, in this case we're talking about Intel, and the actual tools developers, so the people who are writing the development tools that are being used to build the applications on top, because that's usually where that interaction with the hardware comes from. And that cooperation together is an important part of the idea of having an ecosystem around the hardware in order to deliver the best performance out of it. 
Um, the core CPU itself, the actual core CPU is important. We use it a lot, but there's a lot of use cases that are unlocked by these accelerators, and that's why we've seen so much development in that space. But how do we deliver these features in the hardware up into our applications? And fundamentally, we started with virtual machines, and those virtual machines need hardware. Uh, this is the hardware configuration for a vSphere 6.5 uh, virtual machine, and you can see we expose CPUs into it. And that's one of the fundamental things about virtualization. The physical CPU of the host is exposed into the virtual machine, so we're not hiding that CPU. This means that we're delivering those newer features, those accelerators, into virtual machines, and not just on-premises virtual machines, but also cloud virtual machines. On the cloud, we absolutely have all of the providers with the different families of uh, virtual machines, instances on EC2. And these different families have different balances of resources, but it's not just the balance of resources of CPU versus memory. We also see acceleration of things like networking. We have see EC2 instances with 10, 40, 100 gig networking in them. We see hardware acceleration, so GPUs being added to these EC2 instances. And so the underlying hardware is absolutely crucial when we're running our applications and instances. And one of the elements that uh, came up in Ather's perfect configuration discussion, and Melissa's awesome question of why do we not think more deeply than just number of cores and speed, and awareness of your application, awareness of the requirements of, that you're gonna place on this uh, environment that you're deploying, and very importantly, one of the things I see in, in cloud is that a wonderful thing about cloud is you only pay for the resources that you use. But the terrible thing about the cloud is that you pay for all of the resources you use, whether they give you a benefit or not. And this is why aligning the resources in your EC2 instances or any of your other cloud workloads to the actual requirements for your application is crucial. To get the most value out of these EC2 instances, we need to align the resources we're paying with with the value they're delivering and get the maximum value for what we're paying. Now, one of the changes though that we're seeing or have seen, futures here, it's just not evenly distributed, is the move towards containerization. So the use of Docker containers to deliver your applications. Well, these Docker containers are also still aware of the underlying hardware. These Docker containers still see the kernel and through the uh, operating system kernel of the container host, they see the underlying physical hardware. And so Docker containers don't abstract away physical hardware. We're still seeing the feature set of the CPU being delivered up into our software running in Docker containers. And if we start deploying tools like Kubernetes and starting to use service meshes, then it becomes even more critical to us. So a service mesh will have a typically Envoy-based container sitting alongside your application container. And the Envoy container looks after all of the security elements. So the ability to do SSL or IPsec uh, encryption in hardware is going to mean that that Envoy sidecar container doesn't consume huge amounts of the actual core CPU as well. So the benefits for the hardware, even there when we're using uh, Docker containers and, and Kubernetes, which of course is our current hot stuff. Really the challenge becomes where we switch across to serverless platforms, where we have much less of visibility of the underlying physical hardware and control. Now, it's not that we're not going to get benefit out of the underlying physical hardware because serverless platforms run on, depending upon how you implement them, either for something that looks like a virtual machine or something that looks like a Docker container. And so you're still getting the benefits of the underlying physical hardware, it's just that you didn't get to choose it. But the cloud provider did, and the cloud provider will have chosen very carefully the actual physical hardware configuration underneath the serverless platform. So it is still important to the provider, even if it's not important to you. And that's fundamentally the thing about serverless. It's not that there are no servers, it's that just that there's somebody else's problem, somebody else's choice. Still important that we have good CPU capabilities underneath and that our application code is able to benefit from those. And then we start to think about cloud doesn't exist in isolation. In particular, we're normally thinking about a public cloud. Well, most reality for enterprise organizations is hybrid. But there are some applications that are going to remain on premises for a long period of time because there's no financial benefit to the organization to shifting them to cloud. 
Maybe they're tightly coupled with a manufacturing system. Maybe they just don't need the speed of innovation. They feel more like old-fashioned production. But they join together with parts of our applications, parts of our estate that run on public cloud because there's a need for that faster innovation or that universal access component or the scalability that we can get out of public cloud. The reality for enterprise organizations is that gluing the two together and sometimes it also means that we're using the same tool set, same software potentially, has got to move from our on-premises cloud to public clouds. And so having commonality of capabilities across the two is potentially very useful to us. But it drives beyond even just public versus private cloud because the reality for most organizations is really multi-cloud. Uh, the idea that we're using multiple cloud providers, um, again, that commonality of tools across, now, although each of these cloud providers will have some specific capability, we may use the Oracle Cloud because it eases up our Oracle licensing, but we want to use potentially Microsoft's cloud platform because we have a, a large investment in Microsoft technologies. Uh, or we might want to use AWS because it's going to speed up our software development processes. We may even simply be consuming software as a service from somewhere like Salesforce. Now, in all of these places, we've got code running on CPUs that's able to see the underlying capabilities of the CPUs. We may get a lot of benefits from having the same CPU capabilities across because then the portability of our code from location to location is easier. So fundamentally, hardware does still matter in the cloud. You can't just ignore the hardware and say it's somebody else's problem because it's your code, your application that's running. It's your business that's running here. Get the, you do want to get the most out of your spend, whether it's on-premises or hybrid cloud, and you want to get that by aligning the hardware that you're using against the actual requirements for your applications. This presentation was inspired by my own experience of that transition from on-premises infrastructure out into public cloud, and also because I was one of the authors of the Gestalt IT white paper for digital infrastructure at data center scale that we wrote in cooperation with Intel. This is something I say a lot too, actually, uh Little known fact, I actually studied electrical engineering back in the day, right? So I love the hardware layer. And something I tell people is I look, the cloud is just someone else's data center. We still have all the considerations that we normally would have if we were doing this in our own, right? Uh, we don't see it as much, but it's all still there. Now, the one thing I saw that you put up that really, I wanna dive a little deeper and ask a couple of questions is, is you had the chart of the, all the different Amazon EC2 instances. And like that should make it easy for people, right? They should say, oh, I know I'm compute optimized or whatever workload optimized and I should just go get the right flavor. But I've actually seen a lot of people not doing that the right way again, because they're so wrapped up in this idea of, well, it doesn't matter, it's a cloud, it's magic, it'll just fix itself and do whatever. So I was wondering if you could give us like a little bit more color of what you've seen when people are trying to actually make those decisions, but they still have this mindset of, well, you know, it's the cloud, so it's magic and I don't need to worry about any of this stuff. So I think there's a couple of pieces in it. One of the things is people often say, well, this is what I've got on premises, so I want exactly the same in the cloud. Mm -hmm. On premises is a sunk cost. You've already bought all that hardware. It lives for, for three years. And changing the hardware underneath, changing the configuration is relatively expensive. On public cloud, you're paying per hour for the actual resources you use. And, and so there is a, a cost to oversizing your EC2 instances and, and your virtual machines. Yeah, the and whole so, lift and yeah. shift. We'll just take what we have now and put it up there and then you're going to get that first bill. And that's not going to yeah. go so well. <laughs> this is where we, we like the idea of move and improve. So often that lift and shift is, is stage one and stage two should be starting to use more cloud native services to right size things to make sure that uh, you're, you're actually using optimal ec2 instance type so looking at resource utilization over time um, one thing i would flag up though is i've definitely seen an era of going from this is what we had on premises and this is what was being utilized on premises so maybe we've got a, a big database server and the memory utilization is showing as being 40 percent and so we have the amount of memory in the EC2 instance as we deployed as right. a, a, well, you've now halved the amount of cache that's available to the operating system. And so suddenly your database doesn't perform the way it used to. So it is a, a subtle and nuanced thing. And I think this comes back to the discussion that you had with Ather about the hero number kind of lots of CPU cores that much better. It's, it's, it's fundamentally humans don't want to have to think and work too hard. 
And so it's easy to make a decision based on a hero number. It's much harder to make a, a more nuanced decision based on the actual requirements for your application. And this is where, as infrastructure professionals, we start moving up the value chain mm -hmm. by being more aware of what our applications are using and optimizing the actual resources being delivered. And this is one of the things that as we move from on-premises infrastructure, we're knowing the command line on your ESXi host is important towards cloud where you need to be closer to business. This is what we mean by closer to business know what your application actually requires to deliver for that application. In the, in the presentation we had before by Ather, uh, we were talking about you know, building the perfect configuration, the fine tuning and so on. But the interesting thing with the, with the public cloud as well is that you, know, you cannot uh, kind of build a, a one size fit all configuration, especially when we are talking about on-premises, right? So you will be building a kind of best kind of, uh, one size fits all configuration for your environment. And then maybe you're, you'll be thinking more about running specific workloads in the cloud. You were showing some of the instance types there versus you know building dedicated pods because I don't know if the, the economics of building that on-prem is really kind of making sense, you know? I, I think, Max, you're right that the, the economics of building something and designing for platform makes public cloud very appealing. But there's sometimes this challenge of lift and shift the thing we have on premises. So the platforms we have on premises, we tend to have a shared platform that's used by all of our applications on premises. And we're making a set of compromises on how they fit to each of our applications. To hit back to, um, I think it was Ned's question again in that perfect configuration, was around when do you optimize for specific unusual hardware for your workload and fundamentally business benefit when there's enough of a business benefit to, to offset the cost and risk of building a specific platform. Now, one of the cool things about public cloud is the cloud provider takes most of the risk for having these newer platforms. And as I teach the um, development end, it's, you, know, you build a particular service and you say, where do I want to store my data? I don't need enterprise support for a non-relational database when I can consume it as a service off the cloud. Now the cloud provider is using very specially tuned hardware to deliver that serverless service, maybe database as a service. Uh, and this is where we see under, underneath cloud provisioned uh, infrastructure, we're much more optimized to the specific workload. Whereas on premises, we tend to have a shared platform. And that's very much what we see in the, the uh, white paper is this discussion around a general purpose shared platform for building on premises. But on public cloud, it's much more specific um, configuration of hardware for a particular application. Alistair, I think you you touched on this with your serverless section a bit on how the hardware is further abstracted from you. So instead of knowing like the actual platform, the clock cycles, the amount of memory of available, it's more like they try to cloud providers try to abstract it into these weird like database performance units or serverless counter units or you know some kind of weird thing that does kind of map to hardware but but not really. So how, what, how should I be thinking of using platform as a service in my you know, application planning and mapping that to hardware? Is it, do I have to know the exact hardware or is there some other way of, of approaching it? The value benefit for serverless is certainly less driven by hardware configuration. It's the, the provider is spending their time optimizing for, for delivery. And so this is why we see the abstracted um, cost units the, the, the abstracted cost unit is more driven by the, the service that's being consumed. Although I think you're alluding to DynamoDB's read and write capacity units, which is the most ludicrous thing. Uh, it's the hardest thing to allocate against actual applications. But in theory, serverless applications, the cost is more aligned to the value that's being delivered. In terms of as you're designing this, I think it again depends whether you need something that is really optimized versus using a general purpose platform. So taking the example of uh, running a containerized application on AWS, since that's what I'm most familiar with, you have two options of where the containers run. You can run them on Fargate, which is a serverless service. And so you don't get visibility and control of the underlying physical hardware. But you also have the option to, alongside that, run your Docker containers inside EC2 instances and have much tighter control. So what we see on the cloud is you usually have more choice about it. And Corey Quinn likes to joke that there's at least 17 ways to run containers on AWS with differing levels of control, but using the right tool. And this is one of the fundamentals of the cloud is there are so many tools available to you 
choosing the right one to optimize for your application becomes one of the interesting parts. But the cost of using those additional services is much lower than if you had to get enterprise support on premises. Right. So truly, as as the architect behind things who's trying to help the selection of services and hardware, I need to be deeply invested in the application and business use like use case for it. And then be able to select the proper instance size or service that matches up to those needs. Absolutely. And, and as we're seeing more of a move towards microservices architectures and those smaller teams, that skill level needs to be brought into those teams as well, rather than being an abstracted uh, software architect person who is making these decisions across all of the microservices. These decisions have to be made inside the microservice where you have the most awareness of what the application is actually doing and what it's doing with its resources. So when a lot of people think about the cloud, exactly what they're looking for is the opposite of what you've been discussing, is generalization and not having to think about narrow things like you know CPU flags being enabled, which really kind of limits their ability to, to cut into these margins that you've been talking about. For a company that doesn't have an infrastructure team that is as invested as Ned just alluded to, you know, what are some real quick ideas, ways to think about workloads so that they can feel a little bit more comfortable saying, I'm actually going to release this onto an IaaS that has a specialized set of CPU flags enabled as opposed to just the general purpose ones, just so I know, you know, for example, people like to use containers because they're generalized, right? If I run Kubernetes over here, it'll run over there. But if I get into this conversation about flags, I fear that I can't do that kind of compatibility. So what are some real quick things that people can do to just say, okay, I feel good enough about this that it's still going to run? So um, one of the big things that I see with, with containers is, is the value to me is that it's a software distribution mechanism. It's a way of getting that immutable artifact that runs the same in different places with all of the dependencies underneath. But it is going to be dependent on the underlying hardware, what performance you get. So that that don't having to care because everything comes together. That's a software distribution component that's really important in Docker, uh, rather than the actual execution time. Uh, execution time, we absolutely are going to see the, the value of the underlying CPU, a like container running on uh, an old Celeron from the 1990s is going to perform very poorly compared to running it on a current Xeon. So Absolutely, we do see customers who say, I, I have general purpose platforms, I just want a general purpose platform, and uh, I don't want that control. And other times there's business benefit to having that tighter control. And so the teams who, who don't have that visibility down to the lower levels, possibly have never had the driver to get a business benefit from seeing those lower levels, and, and they don't need the optimization that we might get. I, Definitely building the platform for the requirements that you have or choosing the platform for the requirements that you have is important. If your requirements are, are simple, then don't overcomplicate things. Uh, one of the other things is if you are transitioning from on-premises to public cloud, most of the cloud providers have tools that will identify for you your virtual machines that are not using all of your resources or that are saturating resources. Use those automated tools. Don't expect that this is a one and done as you migrate. Expect to be resizing over time. Uh, one of the things we do see is application developers change the optimizations in their code and suddenly an application that was CPU dependent has learned to get lots of performance by using more memory as cache or for holding more data so it can do queries out, out of RAM and suddenly it doesn't care so much about CPU but it needs a lot more memory. The configuration is going to change over time so getting to that, that idea that it's going to be a, a dynamic changing environment is important as you start adopting cloud. Alistair, I, th I think that's a really key point you just brought up. And I don't want anybody to like just glance over that is the fact that we may have tuned the application in a very specific way because of the limited resources that we had on premises. You know, this is the standard pod that we bought and it had this many CPUs and this much memory. And so you had to fit your application to work best in that environment. But when you move to cloud, it's a complete game changer. Now you have carte blanche to, well, maybe not carte blanche, but close to pick a hardware configuration that works best for the application rather than the other way, the way around. And that just opens the door to all kinds of new optimizations. Absolutely. And I, I saw it myself when I built Autolab. Uh, one of the tools that I'm known for is this automated tool for building a, a nested vSphere lab on top of your laptop. Well, I started working with Revalo where you're running on top of public cloud and suddenly they said, well, you don't have all of those resource minimization requirements. You can create your ESX server, your nested ESX server with 16 gigs of RAM if you need. 
right? something I could never do on my laptop. So yeah, absolutely, that uh, massive scalability, but also the dynamic nature of the cloud, that it's not static scalability. And we're typically, as we're moving our applications to public cloud, move towards a scale out model, where we'll deploy more and more small units, and then we'll scale them back in again and get the benefit of those cloud economics. I think fundamentally your application needs to fit on the infrastructure you deploy for it. And uh, being on the public cloud doesn't mean that you don't care about what the underlying physical hardware is. It still matters.